it's good to see you. And uh, let me just say to the audience, just a scene setter here that uh, uh, one, you're gonna hear me ask a, a handful of questions sort of very, very much at the top 30,000 feet, but I assure you we'll start to trick our way down. I thought it was very important that uh, Eric be given an opportunity to sort of take it broad and then we'll work our way down into uh, a whole uh, host of, of questions, some of which I'll ask, some of which came in already prior that you all have provided, which look fantastic. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of live ones uh, that'll come in. And I, I think that's, uh, that's gonna be fantastic. I know Eric's looking forward to that. So with that, um, Eric, let's start with, uh, tell us about Eric Heisen. Who is Eric Heisen? Why are you here? Sure. Well, thank you, Luke. It's great to see you. And thank you to Megan and the whole HSDS HSDF team for this opportunity. Um, I come to this role with, uh, as you know, a very different background for a, a, a federal CIO. Uh, I started out my career in uh, the Silicon, in Silicon Valley, uh, first as a software engineer, then as a product manager. And while I was doing that work, I always knew that I wanted to find ways to serve my country, to help people in need, to do, do more than you get uh, working uh, in a private tech company. Um, and I found that opportunity in 2014 uh, when uh, the US Digital Service was getting created as uh, a part of the uh, follow-up to healthcare.gov. And I uh, jumped in very quickly, uh, came in with really no understanding uh, of how uh, government worked other than an appreciation of public service from uh, my father, who is a retired career fed, uh, but uh, very little beyond that. And uh, I joined, thought I'd be working on healthcare.gov, to be honest, uh, had no knowledge of DHS, no knowledge of the immigration space. And my second day, I got sent over to uh, US Citizenship and Immigration Services to help them uh, with their transformation program as it related to some of President Obama's planned executive actions on immigration. And uh, I thought I'd be there for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, help them get through an initial launch and then go project hopping, work with some other agencies. And instead, I really fell in love with the DHS mission. Uh, the scope of the challenges that are faced uh, across DHS the opportunity uh, that we have throughout the department to leverage technology and data to uh, strengthen our national security, to help um, uh, to help uh, immigrants come to this country, reunite with their families, to uh, strengthen our cybersecurity, uh, to help people respond uh, to national dis natural disasters, uh, to facilitating trade and travel. Uh, just the the mission. Was something I just got hooked on, and uh, what led to my uh, after the Obama administration ended, continuing to work on some of these same issues uh, in philanthropy and in um, and uh, in um, uh, and in the private sector, and uh, really then jumped uh, at the opportunity to come back. So I'm I'm thrilled to be back at DHS, and I'm back here really because I'm so passionate about the mission of the department and the opportunity that we have to uh, make an impact on that through the tools that we have uh, out of uh, the CIO shop. Fantastic, and certainly uh, delighted to see you back. Uh, let's talk about your, your sort of first tenure there. Uh, you were a founding member of the Digital Services, um, uh, came in hot, uh, the whole group did after the uh, healthcare.gov, uh, did a lot of great things up at the White House, and then of course, uh, ran the digital services team at DHS, one of the first ones, uh, one of the biggest ones for some time there, perhaps it still is. Um, did we get everything we wanted to get done there? What, what, what sort of was left on the table at that point as you departed? Uh, just wanted to reflect back on that for a moment. Yeah, well, watching USDS uh, grow and being a part of that growth from um, I think I was employee number five or six, and then it grew across multiple departments to over 200 by the time I left was a, a fascinating um, experience. I think when we started USDS, we thought we were gonna be about a dozen people that would uh, jump in and firefight on projects. And we thought that all of the government's technology challenges would look like healthcare.gov, where you really had a uh, major outage or a problem that could be solved through better technology alone. And 
we then pretty quickly learned what all of you that have been working in this space for, for far longer knew, which is that uh, few problems are that simple uh, and that uh, it takes a very different type of person, a different type of organization uh, to um, make long-term progress on improving the government's use of technology and its ability to deliver services for the public. Uh, so uh, I, through my time at USDS and really through working with you and with us, other strong CIOs and uh, IT organizations across government, learned more about the different roles uh, that this, some of these different organizations play. Uh, and I found that at USDS, we were really uh, good at times at being able to come in, inject some new blood, some new thinking into an area. Uh, but it really depended uh, on us being able to build strong partnerships with the uh, really strong career teams and the contract teams that were already there. And uh, one of the first things I learned was that in almost every case, I think and I, I thought I was coming in as this uh, hot shot from Silicon Valley who was going to have all these new ideas. And instead, I found nearly everything I or my teams were thinking of had been considered or proposed by people throughout the organization uh, for years. And uh, the role that I could play that would be adding value was less coming in with uh, oh, we're, we have Silicon Valley thinking here, we know things that were smarter than you about this, uh, but instead to really say, uh, one, how can we find and elevate those within an organization that are trying to do the right thing? How can we break down silos uh, across the government uh, organizations to um, enable, uh, to enable uh, those folks that are trying to do the right thing to get things done? Uh, and then what is the right balance of uh, new ideas, things that might be struggling to gain traction in the federal world that we can inject there? So I, I saw that role shift. And then as I got to the end of my time, I, I started to think more about uh, what are some of the things that I personally could be doing to uh, support this work uh, at the next level. And that uh, went away from working with individual programs uh, and more towards uh, working to strengthen the overall structures that we're using to, to manage our uh, technology and to deliver services. Um, and to that end, that's what got me thinking about uh, taking a role uh, like this. I never thought I'd end up in a CIO role. Um, and uh, the it ultimately, though, I uh, became really excited about uh, taking this job because I view it as an opportunity to uh, take some of the lessons that I learned working uh, across programs, across the department, working with other agencies, uh, and work on um, some of these uh, bigger structural challenges about how we buy, build, manage uh, RIT uh, across the board. And those are things that I think I uh, can bring a little bit of a different perspective to given my background. Uh, but also have very much learned or are areas that go far beyond my, my prior experiences uh, as uh, part of the digital service team. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, really looking to unlock this capability and accelerate it. Um, you've been on board about three and a half months, if my math is right. Uh, what's your observation so far as you, you look around and re-enter the building, so to speak? Yeah, well, it's been a, it's been a busy few months. Uh, first, um, I've been incredibly impressed by the um, progress that's been made at DHS over the last four years. Uh, not to say things weren't great when you were uh, when you were there, Luke, but I think the uh, it's a journey. The things, right? that, you, a journey. <laughs> <laughs> the things that, we, that that you set in motion and the work that's been done over the last four years has made incredible progress. Uh, the um, the network is more stable. They've managed to transition to telework uh, almost uh, in, in shockingly smoothly, uh, although certainly some bumps along the way. Uh, they uh, managed uh, the response to a major cybersecurity incident uh, with uh, professionalism and uh, all the utmost uh, speed and capability. Um, and uh, so a lot of those, that work that's been done uh, gives um, me the opportunity to work with the team uh, and take a lot of that to the next level. So I'm incredibly appreciative and excited about the work that's been happening. Um, at uh, the same time, initial impressions, uh, there's a lot going on. 
there was a lot going on when uh, the administration started just in managing the response to the solar winds campaign and um, continuing to support uh, the operations through the pandemic. And the administrations come in very fast with uh, a whole host of priorities, uh, almost all of which impact the, uh, the IT organizations across the department, uh, whether that's managing our operations on the border, to vaccinating our workforce, to uh, the uh, very extensive set of and very exciting set of priorities that came out in the president's cybersecurity executive order last night. Um, there's a lot going on. So one of the things that I'm also cautious uh, cautious and working on is making sure that uh, we are moving quickly, but also not uh, overwhelming the teams who've been working so hard for uh, for the last uh, year plus uh, in an already very challenging environment. Sure. And uh, to, to give uh, every prior CIO and the entire uh, community, we, we all stand on the shoulders of those before us, right? Absolutely. And we just kind of keep uh, handing the baton and uh, and everyone takes it to the next level, which is, is beautiful to watch that happen. Uh, your background, um, you talked a little bit about it. You are, it's an unconventional pick, right? Yeah. Let's let's face it. Uh, you hadn't been a CIO in, in any prior lives, kind of came from a, a different sort of community. You get airdropped in there. Um, uh, what, what's your sense of how that's actually an advantage in, in regards to that? What's your feeling there? Sure. Well, it, it is clearly, I think, both an advantage and a challenge. Uh, it's uh, I, and I, this is something that I was very upfront about with the team as I started. Uh, and when I had um, these conversations prior to yeah, on the way, right? We did. And uh, it, one of the things, uh, so in how it's a strength, like I have uh, one, bring a uh, different view than what can be traditional in some agencies of what the role of technology uh, is to uh, to an operation into the mission. I come from a, uh, I, I, I learned how to do this work in a world that didn't think about the silos between IT and the business in the same ways that a traditional breakdown could be. Um, and I think because of that, uh, and that's a direction that IT and many federal agencies have been pushing for for a long time. Uh, I'm able to help accelerate that, I think, because that's really the only way I know how to do business. Um, I also uh, am looking forward to uh, trying to bring strong technical talent from all across uh, the country, uh, including great folks from within government into DHS. Um, but uh, I also know that I am going to be very dependent on those within the department uh, and within my team that uh, are much more familiar with areas uh, that I am not uh, as familiar in. I'm not an infrastructure guy. I'm not a networking guy. Uh, I uh, it was very, I'm incredibly grateful to have a very strong deputy in Beth Capello, who has been leading incredible work in those fronts for several years. Uh, and um, learned and knew, knew coming in and was reinforced very quickly that uh, in a lot of those areas, I uh, am my top priority is going to be strengthening and uh, supporting the team that I uh, already have doing that work, uh, not trying to introduce uh, much, much, uh, uh, much new out of left field there. Sure. Um, you're in a pointed position there. Is there any magic behind that? Is there any expectation there? Is there any sure. secret meetings that go on there? <laughs> Uh, you know, you hear all these things, but I just thought, you know, you're coming in to the Biden administration, yeah. anything there that sort of carries the water, anything that actually helps uh, in the role you're playing? Yeah. I mean, if there are secret meetings, I'm not in them yet. Uh, but the uh, the there was I, by the way. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, it's as I talk to my uh, CIO colleagues across the department, across the government, across the department, um, the, the job is the job is the job, right? We have responsibilities in law, we have um, uh, responsibilities aligned through OMB and within our departments that, that don't change whether you're appointed or not. Um, similar to my background, I think the role being political is in some ways uh, an advantage, in some ways it's a challenge. Uh, in um, It's a challenge because I am coming in, building credibility with the team uh, and um, have, uh, and uh, without the uh, structures that you get coming up sort of through uh, through the ranks here, um, there are certainly way areas in which uh, the 
uh, in which it's, it's helped. Uh, I was part of the transition team. I was able to come in alongside uh, my uh, counterparts in organizations like CISA, in the secretary's office, uh, the new federal CIO in CISO, uh, in OMB, uh, and uh, able to start, uh, get, got a little bit of a head start building relationships with some of those folks through that period. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, um, I uh, view that the job is about effective use of technology to support the department's mission. Uh, and uh, that uh, doesn't change based on how we're defining the role. Bottom line, uh, looks like you've got, you talked about some of your uh, your dream team there. It looks like you have the majority of those folks in, in place there. You want to make any announcements here about what's going on? It sounds like you got some new appointed folks in there. Uh, well, yeah, most recently we uh, welcomed, uh, welcomed, he's been around, but uh, formally welcomed Mike Horton as the chief data officer. Uh, I was incredibly excited about uh, his selection into that role now that it's a uh, distinct role in the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, alongside Carlene Aletto, who's his deputy, and then we brought on uh, Simpson Garfinkel as a senior data scientist coming over from, uh, cen uh, from Census, we've just got a, almost a dream team in that organization. And that's something that is so critical to uh, the, um, the work that uh, work we're going to be doing uh, in, in this administration because the we're, we are seeing already and we'll continue to see just the need for effective use and integration of data across our components and across government uh, to support our mission, whether that's how we're getting our department vaccinated across components, whether that's um, sharing data to be able to uh, manage our operations at the border. Uh, there, there's a demand from the secretary and from his team for um, effective operational use of data that doesn't care what component or what office that data is coming from. Uh, that's going to uh, really accelerate, I think, the work of, of that team. So I've been very excited to see that. Congratulations to Mr. Horton and uh, um, job well done by Carlene as well. Uh, let's talk about digital services for a minute. Uh, you know, obviously, you had a digital services background, and sort of the buzz was, okay, here they come. They're coming over the hill. You know, they're gonna they're gonna get airdropped in. Uh, you, you you have a a nice team there, effective team at DHS. We've heard about these strategic advisors. What's sort of the plan? What, is there going to be pods of digital services folks in the operating components? How do you, how do you sort of envision that, or is that sort of a, a TBD? We're going to learn uh, with the components, uh, with the teams to see what what works. Um, mm -hmm. The one of the things that I learned from my first stint was that uh, the digital service model in isolation only gets you so far. And um, I, I remember you pushing me to say, why don't you why don't you take some uh, folks from other parts of the CIO org and have them embed in your teams and vice versa to get some cross pollination there. And I uh was I I I it's I think I pushed back a little because I didn't I thought that would slow us down. And I came to realize that uh one, that's not going to slow you down. You need every part of uh expertise, uh every type of expertise and knowledge in a team like that. But two, uh that sort of cross-pollination is the only way that we're going to uh really adapt how uh, we are thinking about um, delivering services across the department. So I don't know what it will look like uh, exactly yet, and it's something we're going to be doing in consultation with the, the teams and the components, but uh, I am eager to start thinking about how we take some of what, what we learned there, what worked, what didn't work, and uh, broaden that out. Um, one, of, one of the specific ways I've seen with that is uh, some of the unique hiring practices that USDS used, um, uh, which where you're not, um, you're not going through a uh, lengthy USA jobs process that's driven by a re review of your 30 page government resume, but really having subject matter experts understand your technical qualifications. Um, they've ended up uh, turning that into a service that can be used for other uh, other technology hires. And uh, we're using that in our operations group to staff up our network operations and security center. And we're finding that it's uh, incredibly 
uh, effective tool and uh, lessons that we learned out starting out in that world that we can now apply in other parts of the uh, the organization. So I'm mm. eager to see more of that as we go. Very cool. Um, speaking of the components, uh, do you feel like you've got the right balance there in regards to uh, you know what's happening at headquarters proper versus what's happening inside the the CIO organizations inside the components? There's a good mix a structure of roles and responsibilities? I think so. I mean, DHS is so big, has such a broad mission that um, the structure that we have with the components, uh, having strong CIO shops is um, exact, is, is the only way to do it. Uh, I um, do, there are, well, I think we are seeing an increased demand for integration across the components. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we look to do that through increased collaboration, through uh, better data sharing, through thinking about how we're strengthening how our systems talk to each other, uh, not through adjusting our, our responsibilities there. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned and thought about a lot as I was thinking about uh, taking this job was sort of my first exposure to the DHS CIO role, period was when I was working at USCIS Transformation and uh, you and Margie, who was the deputy at the time, held a every other week meeting with uh, this, the USCIS leadership that was entirely framed around what can we do for you? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't um, here's headquarters telling you how to do your job. It wasn't why are you not hitting schedule? We demand more reporting. It was we trust you. Uh, you have the, you are closest to the mission. You know what you need to get done. What can I take at, get out of your way? And that's something that I uh, really want to emulate uh, in in the work that we're doing. Servient leadership uh, goes a long way. I will, I will tell you, um, yes. it's the uh, it's the best part of the job, quite frankly. Uh, let's talk about enterprise services, if you will. Um, sure. Uh, you know, that's, again, that balance and that mix, right? Do you feel like you have the right balance? You've got the data center activities going on, some other activities. You know, we did the flash activity. Is it, do you see a need for flash 2.0? You know, whatever it is, is there a, is there a sense that there's going to be more enterprise type capabilities at the department offered so that the components can just pull from that as they try to deliver on their mission? I, I don't know yet. I think we're going to uh, work to learn. I, I will say, I don't think we're going to do a flash 2.0. Uh, the, the journey that I went I, on. I had to put it out there. You yeah. know, now, now that Troy can't slap me because I'm sitting beside her. Um, she'll find a way through teams, I'm sure. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the journey that I went on that I think a lot of us that came in from these non-traditional backgrounds uh, into the government technology space is, we come in, we first think, oh, we can fix everything through uh, through tech alone. Uh, you can't, it's a lot more than that. Then uh, about a year in, I realized, you realize that uh, the role of procurement and uh, the role of building strong partnerships with industry and uh, the things that we were too naive coming in to really appreciate uh, that all of everyone working in there already had been telling us. Uh, and then you try to solve it with a big bang. And uh, I think with that was my experience with Flash. And I think you've seen that with some of these other initiatives uh, across the government where you try to go too big too quickly. And um, my, my main lesson there was that uh, we tried a lot of really smart things. And uh, many of those have continued uh, throughout uh, department procurements, whether that's uh, looking at uh, technical challenges uh, for our vendors in new ways, whether it's having uh, your application consists not just of a written proposal, but of code that's getting reviewed or uh, understanding how you interact with a product owner or with your users through that evaluation process. So I think there's a lot of good work that you can learn from that, uh, but then you want to apply that across the board, not try to do one big bang effort. 100% there, well said. Um lessons learned. Uh, let's talk about tech foraging. There's a lot of uh, buzz out there, right? A lot of activity out there. s and still got the uh, Silicon Valley office over there that's, uh, you know, on full cylinders. Uh, what, what's your sense about tech foraging at, at the CIO's organization, the CIO community at large, et cetera, et cetera? Where, where's, your, where's your thinking on that? Yeah, and we have a great relationship with the team at s and that has mm -hmm. uh, strengthened over the years. And 
uh, excited to continue to leverage uh, the work that they're doing. Um, personally, I you're you're not going to hear me talk about uh, talk about a lot of buzzwords, uh, and that's really because I I really believe that m the challenges that we have, our biggest opportunities, aren't around leveraging and finding this really cutting edge new tech. It's about getting the basics right. Uh, doing work on uh, better data sharing, uh, exposing our, our information through APIs, uh, leveraging open source software and sharing code across the department, uh, better embracing mobile. These aren't things that are cutting edge uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's uh, work that has been going on within the department and within uh, private sector for quite a while. And uh, I, I'm eager to really focus there on how can we uh, learn from what's already working, from what is established, and uh, get build a foundation there. Sure. Block, tackle, unlock, accelerate. Um, all right, let's start getting into it. Solar winds, big deal, right? Uh, you're one of the agencies that got right smack in the middle of that. A lot of talk about zero trust, and perhaps that's the uh, the path forward. I think everyone's curious to know if there's a grander plan. Is there uh, some of the TMF funding that perhaps gets associated to that, et cetera? I'm kind of bundling up a couple of questions here, but I sure. think you get the drift of, of the, uh, the question. Yeah, so clearly we have a lot of work to do on our own cybersecurity. We are the department that houses CISA and our goal and the secretary's very clear goal for us is that we're going to lead the rest of the federal government uh, when it uh, comes to our own cybersecurity practices. And uh, there's been a lot of good work that's been going on uh, to do that uh, from some of our work standing up a, a supply chain risk management program being one of the first departments in the government to do that, uh, to some of the work that uh, we've done evaluating and certifying uh, security operations centers across uh, the government in partnership with uh, with CISA. So there's been a lot of good work, but there, there's clear, clearly more to do. And I think the what you saw yesterday with the cyber executive order, uh, what we were able to get from con uh, through Congress in the uh, American Rescue Plan gives us a, a really strong foundation to do that. And um, we sort of are looking at that in two ways. Uh, one is how are we building out uh, our core cybersecurity services, uh, people, infrastructure uh, to serve headquarters and serve the department at large. Um, a lot of that looks like uh, staffing up. Uh, that's uh, leveraging more innovative hiring practices to be able to bring on the right talent. The secretary's made this a top priority. Uh, we're also uh, working to launch the cyber talent management system that will give us a lot of really exciting tools to uh, attract and retain top cyber talent. Uh, it looks like building out our supply chain risk management program more, and that's one where we're going to need a really close partnership with uh, everyone on this call because uh, we are going to be asking more of our vendors and our partners in industry. Uh, and um, as I'm sure everyone that reviewed the EO uh, yet, uh, last night noted, there's a lot in there that's going to ask a lot more of those that are selling software to the government as well. And we need to and we will do this in a coordinated way that partners with industry, that avoids uh, overly burdening um, our partners, that uh, continues to enable us to access uh, small and minority-owned businesses, innovative uh, and non-traditional government contractors, but that's going to have to be something we are constantly looking out for as we implement all of that work. And are you looking for the TMF to uh, to source some of the funding? It sounds like a lot of activity. I'm sure that you're going to need to have some funding to address these needs. Oh, absolutely. And um, the, the TMF is an incredible incredible opportunity to really get a, a down payment in some of our modernization efforts. And mm -hmm. we're looking at that uh, both on some of those core cybersecurity activities, but also around our uh, key programs across the department, because uh, it is uh, no matter how much, and this really gets into this notion of a zero trust architecture, your network wide or your enterprise cyber defenses only get you so far if you're not operating on uh, systems that are built to be secure by design. And uh, that's some of the work that we 
uh, hope that we can leverage the TMF to do while also uh, enabling us to deliver better services to the public and to our, our, our users uh, through, uh, through that work as well. But I, I very much expect us to be an active uh, user of, uh, of the TMF. And while all those plates are spinning, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, the Southwest border situation. We know that you in particular and your team are spending a lot of time with that. Um, uh, can you just give us sort of a top line on uh, what is the activity there and where do you see some of the technology that you're using or accelerating uh, to, uh, to address those needs? Sure. Uh, well, the, the challenges that the, the administration and the department's facing at the border are um, really uh, giving um, us uh, a, ch a challenge and an, and an opportunity to show how technology and data can uh, deliver value on the mission, not in the speed of a multi-year modernization effort, but right now. And uh, we are working, a lot of our work there has been uh, how do we better bring together data from across uh, CBP, ICE, HHS, uh, others to present uh, a common operating picture of uh, what, what's going on, what our capacity is, how are we uh, modeling out our capacity uh, over time, uh, and then how can we use technology to start to streamline some of our processes because ultimately uh, our border patrol agents, our ICE officers, uh, are law enforcement agents. And uh, every minute they're spending uh, filling out forms, uh, handling administrative processing tasks is a minute that they're not spending doing their actual job, which is keeping our country safe. And so we see a lot of opportunities uh, to uh, better leverage technology there. And that's something that we've had uh, strong support from uh, the leadership of those, those components to do. All right, we're, we're uh, rolling along on the hour here. I want to ask one last question, and we're going to light it up to the, uh, the rest of the community here. Uh, just paint a picture of uh, the North Star, if you will, uh, at the end of the first Biden administration term. Uh, what is your expectation? Of what does the environment look like at that point? What's your vision? What's your goal, if you will, as far as you can clarify that at this point? Uh, well, one, I think at that point, as we're already doing, I, uh, I want to see DHS leading the way when it comes to our own cybersecurity practices. I want us to be uh, constantly um, out there uh, doing uh, work that it, uh, doing work for our own defenses and our own practices that are uh, setting the bar for where other federal agencies uh, are, are following. Uh, and I think we're well on our way uh, to, to doing that. Um, I uh, want to see our, um, our uh, department IT workforce uh, viewed and empowered as true partners in uh, supporting the execution of the mission. Uh, and uh, really uh, with seats at the table with their operator, with the operators, uh, working together to see how technology can best support the operation, best unlock efficiencies, and uh, increase the impact of their work. And uh, I also want to see um, us rethinking how we deliver services uh, to the public. Um, someone who's uh, coming in, uh, who's traveling uh, in or out of the country, shouldn't have to know the distinctions between, oh, this is what CBP does, this is what TSA does, this is what the State Department does. Uh, if you're navigating the immigration system, you shouldn't have to learn different form numbers or uh, understand what parts are USCIS, what parts are ICE, what parts are other departments. Uh, and I, uh, it, that's a long-term uh, effort that goes well beyond technology, but I want our use of technology to be uh, starting to break down some of those barriers so that our services are actually designed around the people that uh, depend on them, not around our work charts. And to that end, in regards to the community that's out there, the partner community that's out there, what's the message you want to give them? One, uh, I welcome the opportunity to, con to continue to learn from and engage with you. Uh, the work that uh, we are doing here that DHS has been doing for several years uh, deeply depends on uh, the expertise, the, the passion, the skills that you all bring. And I, I have been 
so impressed with uh, the the quality and commitment uh, of um, not just our employees, but of our our industry partners as well uh, in supporting this work. Uh, and uh, I know there is a lot that we can learn from you on uh, that we uh, can do to um, best uh, understand what uh, what is out there and how you can support uh, the work that we're setting out to do and uh, as a department as well. World class industrial base out there. Megan, over to you. Sure, great. Well, well, thanks, Mr. Heisen and Luke. That was an excellent discussion. And I think we've touched on a lot of really great areas. So we want to move into our Q&A portion. And I know we have some event partners that are going to be asking questions on camera, and then we're going to get to questions from our general audience. So appreciate the questions you've already submitted through the Q&A function. You're welcome to continue to uh, send us questions. And um, kicking off our Q&A for us today is going to be uh, Bo Swanson with Dell Technologies. Hey, good afternoon, Eric, and, and thanks for the time here, Luke. The conversation's been great up to this point. Um, Eric, my question is, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the role that 5G and, and edge computing is going to play um, in the DHS mission and, and any potential hurdles you see in, in leveraging those technologies? Sure. No, I think we uh, we see a lot of opportunities uh, for um, 5G to enhance uh, our mission from the work that we're, we're doing uh, with our, our joint wireless uh, program office, better uh, supporting our components uh, in their use of wireless technology for tactical communications or investigative uses uh, to um, enabling uh, sensor networks uh, along the border to um, uh, deploying uh, all of the areas in which we're deploying technology across um, across uh, are areas with uh, heart with limited connectivity uh, where uh, traditional deployment may be challenging. So I think we we see a tremendous opportunity there. Um, clearly, the challenge is how do we uh, really understand the the cybersecurity uh, implications and um, uh, early on in that process uh, and make sure that we are uh, deploying technology intentionally uh, and uh, in a in a way that uh, where we fully understand what um, where we fully understand what some of that would mean for our operations. But I think it's an incredible opportunity and one that will uh, be look we are looking at quite closely. Great. Um, and next up, we have uh, Drew Ramsey with Red Hat. Good afternoon, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, also excited to see you in the role with, uh, with your background in software engineering. Um, so a little context for my question. Um, <clears throat> we've seen an increased adoption of Kubernetes in many programs and, and many agencies over the, the recent years. Um, as this adoption is, as we've seen this grown, um, we've seen that a lot of existing or, or potentially even outdated uh, security policies um, have really become barriers to, to, to like actually taking advantage of that type of technology. Um, and, and also with the mission of automating a lot of ATO processes. Um, and specifically just a, a, seeing a lack of, of guidance for best practices in running containers and, and kind of the broader ecosystem of Kubernetes, um, even all the way down to you know, things like pulling containers from trusted sources, things like that. So my question for you is, you know, what are your thoughts on, on this being an area of concern? Um, and how would you look to provide uh, guidance to the department components um, on security best practices for containers and Kubernetes? Yeah, um, I think it's a great uh, point. And one, so we are uh, finishing up our uh, selection process for our new, uh, for our chief technology officer role. And uh, as we finalize that selection, I think that's a role in an organization that I'm looking uh, to engage closely uh, with our, our CISO uh, and our CISOs across the department in uh, understanding how we um, adapt our processes uh, to best support modern development and uh, modern um, infrastructure activities. So I, uh, while while we have been able to see uh, a lot, uh, some strong adoption, uh, whether it's of containerization, whether it's uh, continuous uh, CICD or uh, d deployment pipelines, uh, things like that, I uh, it's, it's obvious that our policies don't always keep up as uh, quickly as they need to. Uh, but I think that goes beyond just cybersecurity. That extends to this notion of how we 
govern our acquisition programs that still really looks at this notion of taking several years to uh, get to um, an initial operating capability uh, when we want to be able to deliver value in a matter of weeks or months, not years, uh, as we kick off new work. So I think there's work across the board to do that um, our, our CTO organization and community across the department can do to make sure that all of our policies are uh, strengthening and incentivizing some of this uh, modern modern behavior. Great, and we have another question from uh, Brian Michael with GDIT. Thank you, and Eric and Luke really appreciate today's discussion, um, the opportunity to be here. Eric, you talked a, a lot about the importance of sharing data across the components and other government agencies. C couldn't agree more. C can you share a little bit more um, your thoughts on the key things that DHS and industry need to do to better unlock that mission value of the data? Um, while keeping it secure, and if you could, you know, does your digital U.S. digital services experience offer any uh, notable lessons learned about how to make that data usable or actionable? Sure. Um, so, as we've been working to stand up our, our chief data officer team, uh, one one of the things that we've reflected on is that. Um, DHS was, as a department, created with an information sharing mandate. We were created in, in response to 9-11 with this notion that uh, housing all of these functions within a single department would enable better information sharing uh, to uh, prevent future attacks. And it's something that we've certainly uh, struggled to realize uh, as the department has grown and matured. Um, one of the lessons that, that I've learned has been that uh, it's, it's too easy for us to come in and say, we're headquarters, we're big DHS, give us all your data because uh, we say so. We're going to create this one data sharing system to rule them all, uh, and you'll all get value from it. And uh, that's something that I think has been tried uh, in various forms and doesn't work because it's not driven by the needs of our operators. Uh, what we need to be doing is really uh, learning from what, what our operators need and are doing already in the field. What are those areas where they're already making data sharing happen because they're emailing spreadsheets uh, back and forth uh, or they've developed something locally? And what can we learn from that to, uh, to go uh, from there and, uh, and, and scale out? Um, the way we've structured our uh, CDO operation is uh, around eight different data domains that are areas that range from uh, intelligence to immigration to uh, travel and trade that involve multiple components and multiple parts of the department. And our goal is to um, design the efforts around those unique mission needs, not to say that we're going to have one, one single approach, one single system to rule them all. Great. And um, Luke just wanted to give you an opportunity to see if there's any follow-up questions you might have. I mean, I, I, I was remiss to ask the golden question, uh, the obvious one. Give us your top three priorities, Eric. Sure. Uh, I got into that a little bit uh, at uh, your, the end. I think I've covered most of these throughout, but um, number one is cybersecurity. It is uh, ensuring that DHS lead by example. Uh, both in our uh, overall defenses and practices and our uh, movement to a zero trust architecture and building secure systems across the department by design. Um, two is that element we were just talking about of strengthening our operational use of data and our integration um, across our mission areas. Um, and then the third, which I, I spoke a little about at the end, is our uh, improving the uh, public and customer experience of our uh, of our services through technology and in some cases not uh, and um, uh, using this as a way to uh, reduce the burden that the department places on the public and let's dip down into that first one if we would because there's a, there's been several questions about it and this is around uh, consolidation of the uh, the SOX at headquarters eSOX you touched on this uh, assessment that was done uh, there's been a lot of talk, Beth, and, and your and prior CIO talks about a, a NOSC, et cetera. So what's the, what's the current thinking there about that strategy? Uh, well, so strengthening our uh, security operations centers is a top priority administration-wide as part of their follow-up to, uh, to SolarWinds. 
And uh, what we are looking at at DHS is that we have a strong, and I've been incredibly impressed by the effort to, to bring together uh, the new Network Operations and Security Center. We are aggressively hiring for that team. That's the area that we're using some of these uh, innovative uh, subject matter expert hiring practices from USGS to build out that organization. Uh, also one where we are going beyond the DC area. We're hiring there in Arizona and Mississippi to make sure that we can access uh, broad pools of talent across the country. Um, and if we can provide services for components, uh, we are uh, we are happy to. But again, DHS has such a broad uh, broad mission that uh, our components will have their own unique uh, operational needs there as well. So we we've stood up this um, cloud service provider uh, and CSP assessment program that's been uh, working to certify our SOCs across the department uh, and also. Uh, just recently with the uh, the DOJ SOC, uh, also done that uh, in partnership with CISA for uh, another federal department. And we think through that combination, we can build a world-class operations center at headquarters that serves uh, some of our components, but also make sure that those that have their own unique operational needs have a strong and certified um, uh, uh, SOC in their, um, uh, in their own component as well. Mm -hmm. And in regards to that uh, sort of that, I'll say balance, probably not the right term, of looking at high value assets, modernizing them to ensure that one, they can deliver on that promise to the, the citizen, if you will, uh, along with uh, being uh, secure from the, from the beginning. Uh, how many of those environments are we talking about? Do you, do you have any sense? Is there dozens and dozens of these that are they're sort of in that state that might be potential candidates for, let's say, the TMF fund? I don't think we know yet. I mean, certainly you start with our lists of high value assets and you can can go on from there. Um, but uh, there, the, T, the TMF funds and the uh, a billion dollars is a lot of money, but it is really nothing more than a down payment on modernizing our systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that was acknowledged uh, by the administration when we first proposed this, these funds and I think was clearly recognized through, um, uh, through the work that's being done to, to start to implement it. So um, we are, uh, in, we're going to take a few uh, initial steps, uh, try to propose uh, some key areas that uh, we think will simultaneously strengthen our security while also uh, better delivering services for the public uh, and go from there. But certainly don't certainly we have a lot more to do than uh, just working through uh, through the TMF. Sure. Um, pivoting for a minute here. Uh, let's talk about acquisition strategy. We talked about good old flash 2.0. Totally understand that. And uh did get a note from Soraya on the chat there. So uh, yes, uh, of course, she's uh, reaching out. Um, OTA, CSOPs, all these other types of uh, ways that uh, DHS is using to accelerate some of the acquisition process. Do you see uh, yourself uh, sort of leveraging a lot of that capability? You're sort of good with what you have. What's the thought there as far as how these acquisition strategies will get laid out? I'll uh, be the first to say this is an area where uh, I have a lot to learn. Um, right. I, and I am incredibly grateful to have a great partner with Soraya uh, at CPO and also with all the work they've been doing through the Procurement Innovation Lab uh, over the years uh, to, to lead the way here. Um, I uh, don't know that I can get and speak in any level of uh, value on specific mechanisms or strategies. But what I can say is that uh, I want us to be able to access new and innovative companies uh, more quickly. I want us to be able to uh, try approaches out uh, and uh, start small uh, with, uh, with our uh, development work. Uh, and if we think that uh, a new technology that might be offered by a group of vendors is interesting to us, uh, want to look at the ways in which we can um, access that quickly uh, and and test it out and and test it out in practice rather than uh, paralyzing ourselves in uh, analysis and research uh, before uh, uh, by such points so that the technologies have already evolved or moved on. So um, that's all areas in which I'm eager to work with with everyone here and with uh, with our procurement teams on. 
Let's jump over to CISA for a minute. A lot of activity there, a whole bunch of activity uh, out of the, uh, the relief package. And now with the ex executive order calling on them to do a lot of different activities. You and I talked about uh, strengthening that relationship to adopting some of these capabilities, incubating them before they're uh, 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 proliferated across the, uh, the interagency, et cetera. Give us the latest on your thinking there about uh, you know, the role of uh, CIO proper and the role of CISA, and then how, the, how does that get strengthened going forward? Yeah, well, CISA has come a um, long way, uh, even becoming its own component uh, since since I was last at the department, and they've they've made incredible progress. And uh, they strengthening CISA's role in um, our federal cybersecurity is uh, a top priority for the administration. It's something you saw constantly in the EO. And one of the things, and I think there, there are really two roles for the DHS CIO there. Uh, one is, as you said, this early adopter, trusted tester and partner in uh, leveraging CISA's new services, uh, which we are have done or continue going to continue to do. And then two, uh, when you look at a lot of these priorities, uh, they actually look like CISA <laughs> building and delivering a lot of new IT services to other agencies as well. And so uh, one of the conversations that I've had with uh, with the team over there is uh, how are we, we're not, we're not going to be the ones that come in and say, uh, this is your uh, cybersecurity approach, that's their job and their expertise. But uh, I do think we'll have roles to play in partnering with the CISA team and uh, helping strengthen their CIO organization so that they're able to deliver uh, effective IT uh, services that I and other department CIOs are eager to use. And I think they've, they've got a great team doing that, uh, that uh, will, will be great partners there. Sure, and we did, um, we did get a few questions around cloud that I wanted to get to. And in particular, you know, there's, there's acknowledgement that you know, DHS uses a number of different cloud providers. And people are just curious to maybe get your thoughts on how you think you can better facilitate integration between these providers and around cloud platforms. And then maybe secondary to that, you know, how do you measure success in terms of the DHS cloud journey? And are there any specific metrics that you might have in mind as you look at that? Sure. Uh, well, we've been in a cloud migration journey for for quite a while uh, across the department, and we've um, the And I think ultimately uh, the, the strength that we have in our approach at DHS is that we are leveraging multiple different clouds, different providers. Uh, and um, I think we are learning across the department and sharing knowledge on uh, what's working, what's not. Uh, but um, what uh, what's worked at ICE uh, for their cloud migration strategy might not be what works for a place like CDP uh, or some of our smaller components. Uh, so I think, um, my approach so far has been continue to let the components lead, uh, work to best support them. We've looked at uh, designing our uh, our deco vehicle, uh, really with a lot of uh, a lot of that in mind, and uh, and uh, ultimately then from a technical perspective, uh, making sure that we are able to take advantage of uh, being in multiple different cloud environments, leveraging different solutions that we are not getting boxed into specific platforms, specific tools, uh, but um, able to take advantage of this. Um, and I think that's uh, the work that will continue to continue to go down. Uh, purpose built versus, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, platform pro uh, products, uh, low code, no code, or just what's your, your, your sort of sense there? What's the feeling uh, in the building about uh, preferred sort of environment there? I think it's an oversimplification to say you can prefer one or the other. Uh, the, I think too often we see a low code configuration only offering that where you're right, you, you end up writing just as many lines of configuration as you'd actually write custom code. Uh, so I, I certainly, I support, and I think the, the team is pushing towards maximal reuse and not building something from scratch when we don't have to, but that can take many different forms. In, in some cases, it might be buying an off the shelf product. Uh, in some cases, it might be configuring. Uh, in other cases, it might be 
um, something that looks like custom software, but is really based on uh, open source and other reused code uh, in ways that we get many of those same advantages. So it's not going to be a one size fits all answer, but but certainly uh, have that as an overall goal. Sure. And I think, you know, another good question we got just based on your experience, Mr. Heisen, and the digital services too, is, you know, just looking at the balance between, you know, embracing emerging, emerging technology, but also accounting for potential new risk in the environment. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Luke might have some thoughts on this too, but how do you, what kind of guidance would you have in terms of looking at, you know, balancing the risk mitigation, risk mitigation piece with innovation at DHS? Yeah, I think this is where uh, moving to a zero trust architecture really becomes key, that uh, we stop looking at our network as um, we have our wall up, our perimeter defense outside, and once you're in, you can get to anything. And um, if we can do that effectively, we can start to think about different systems and the different levels of data and sensitivity of the operations they handle. Uh, in ways that says uh, certain systems are going to be uh, a little bit uh, more on the conservative side, but we're still able to test out new technologies on our network, in our systems, uh, in other areas, uh, while still um, being able to uh, preserve the integrity and the security of uh, some of our higher value systems. Sure. And, you know, I think another another good point you highlighted earlier, Mr. Heisen, in terms of your kind of long term vision is, you know, you mentioned that you really want the department's IT workforce to be seen as, you know, real partners in executing the DHS mission. And I guess, you know, just a question around there about, you know, how do you influence sort of the, the workplace culture or how do you motivate the workforce? And just if you have any thoughts you might want to share around that. Sure. Well, first, we have an incredibly talented IT workforce, both at headquarters and across the components, and they have they have stepped up in in such incredible ways over the last uh, over the last year to uh, get through the pandemic, to uh, handle the shift uh, in many cases to telework, to uh, supporting just these this incredible pace uh, of change and new demands across the department. So uh, they, they are they are doing incredible work already. Uh, and the as uh, I look at um, driving, I think some of I think the culture changes those pockets where we're still looking at this as uh, well. We have a customer; they give us our requirements, and uh, that's that's it. And ultimately, uh, as we start to break down that model, uh, we want to be sure that our team and the teams uh, that are engaging with our IT, uh, our IT folks are um, able to go and think in more of uh, more of an agile mindset that they are able to uh, work together to break down what problems they're facing and think together about uh, how technology can help them with that. And that's not an overnight thing. Uh, that is uh, work that I think we we see happening incredibly well in many parts of the department. And um, will ultimately, I think, just the more we are able to show that uh, our CIO organizations department wide are are operating in that way, or adding value, uh, the more and and the more we are highlighting those projects that um, uh, that do so, uh, the um, the better off we'll be. I think um, one of the programs I spend a lot of time with these days that's powering a lot of our um, our uh, data our data and reporting ar around the border is a system that came out of CDP called the Unified Immigration Portal. And it didn't start with a big uh, department-wide or congressional mandate to build a whole new system. It started because our Border Patrol agents had challenges with how they were accessing data and they built an effective partnership with their IT colleagues and they were able to start getting something done. And it has grown into a um, incredibly vital part of our, uh, uh, of our operation. And I think the more we highlight and encourage efforts like that, that grow out of those strong partnerships, the better off we'll be. Sure. And yeah, appreciate all the questions that everyone's been submitting. I know we've gotten through quite a few of them, so keep them coming. But I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask Mr. Heisen just about generally looking at sort of priorities or your vision for emerging technologies around, you know, AI, ML, looking at virtual reality potentially, or even quantum. If you have any thoughts 
you could share, that'd be great. And I, I know you said you don't like buzzwords necessarily, but uh, appreciate your thoughts. Sure. Um, with all of those areas, I mean, there are there are certainly areas of valuable application for our department, uh, but but I really start with what are the needs of our operators on the ground? What um, what problems are they trying to solve and what are the technologies that can help with that? Uh, if that is any of the technologies you mentioned or anything else, uh, then I am, I am all in on exploring that. But uh, the approach that I try to avoid is uh, this, this notion of sort of a technology in, in search of a problem. And um, I think with several of the areas that, that you mentioned, uh, I, that sometimes, not always, but that sometimes is the, uh, the approach that we see. Uh, and I want to be sure that we are um, pivoting any of those efforts really to be grounded uh, in the needs of the operators that we're trying to serve. Hey, Eric, to, to that end, uh, you talked about the Southwest border and, and, and what, what technologies, obviously there's some business applications there that are using some workflow, et cetera. What other technology, technologies are you looking to potentially use down there uh, that are currently sort of maybe in the pipeline or possible types of technologies that you may end up needing based on what you're observing? Sure. I don't know that I can speak too much to some of the specific thinking, just given the very uh, evolving nature of, of sure. the situation mm -hmm. down there. But um, broadly, uh, a lot of the work is really just better sharing of data across uh, across the components that are doing this work. We've got major operations that are still driven on uh on uh, paper coming uh, coming and being passed between components. And that slows down our ability to move and it puts pretty heavy administrative burden on folks. Um, when you look at the work that CBP is doing uh, broadly in uh, facilitating, um, in facilitating uh, travel and, and migration of all kinds, I think there's a lot that can be done through uh, smart and uh, intentionally privacy respecting applications of, uh, of biometric technology, and particularly in the pandemic environment, uh, any ways that we can avoid uh, human con like, uh, physical contact between our uh, operators and people that they're working to uh, review or process can make a big difference in ensuring the health and safety of our workforce, but also um, efficient processing. Uh, so I think those are a, a few of the areas, but it's certainly um, something where we're, there's sort of a lot more that we have to learn. Maybe on the same lines with the pandemic, we really didn't touch on that a whole lot. And I know there's a lot of activity going on there, sort of internally within your own employees. And then, of course, the role that FEMA plays, et cetera. Well, just give us a top line on sort of the pandemic activities and the CIO's role in that. Sure. Uh, well, first, it has been... Um, managing the transition to telework. And uh, that was work that the team did incredibly effectively um, over the over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we um, were able to find the numbers uh, that I had because this was work that was done before I started. But um, we uh, were able to uh, massively grow our traffic over our VPN, our uh, ability to get work done through through video conferencing, through other collaboration tools, um, in ways that I think have um, uh, enabled telework to be much more successful than than many folks think we're expecting. Um, recently, that's shifted into how we support our efforts to vaccinate our workforce. Uh, so DHS launched a partnership with uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs to uh, enable our frontline workers to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we worked across the department to manage the uh, systems and technology to um, understand who our frontline workforce are and uh, communicate with them, get them signed up, get them vaccinated. And then as we, uh, as we come back uh, and enter this next phase, I think what's, there's going to be a really critical role for uh, CIOs across the department to play in enabling a uh, hybrid telework uh, office culture. Um, everything uh, uh, from how do we make sure that our conference rooms are set up uh, so that you can have um, 
meetings with some folks in the office, some folks on video, uh, to um, rethinking uh, what our abilities to handle office environments where not everyone will need their own desk or own office anymore. Uh, really trends that were starting well before the pandemic, but are only going to be accelerated now. And I think we're going to be uh, looking hard at how we can best support uh, support that transition. Sure, and um, I have you know one more question for you, Mr. Heisen, and then I'm going to turn it over to Luke um, to maybe ask a final question and, and some closing thoughts. But you know, I know you had mentioned cybersecurity is a huge priority, and you know, just as you know, joining DHS as CIO in February, you know, what were you most proud of that you saw in terms of how you've been working to improve the cybersecurity posture within DHS, and then maybe what do you foresee as maybe your largest cyber challenge? Sure. Um, I was and I am just so proud of how how the teams across the department responded to uh, to the solar winds breach. It was a unprecedented uh, uh, event. It was a, a deeply complex operation, and uh, the teams through a tremendous amount of uncertainty through the middle of a, of a presidential transition, one of the hardest times to handle a situation like this. Uh, got, uh, was able to effectively respond. We uh, built great partnerships with CISA, with uh, others in supporting the response. Uh, and um, gate, and then ultimately we're able to ensure that we could do our jobs, uh, which um, when you have a, a new administration coming in, not knowing the status of, uh, of your operations, I think the, um, the work that we were able to do uh, and the team was able to do to allow them to hit the ground running in spite of that was truly incredible. Um, in terms of uh, biggest challenge, um, it really is to that point that, that Luke was making uh, around just the number of systems that we're talking about as we look to modernize. And this is why moving to a zero trust architecture, embracing secure systems by design is, is harder. Uh, than a perimeter security approach because we can't just build one set of network defense tools and call it a day. Uh, we have a massive IT portfolio across this department. We have systems that go back decades and uh, thinking about uh, how we work because we will not modernize every system overnight. We, uh, we will, This is a ongoing effort thinking about how we mitigate that risk, look at such a wide portfolio uh, of systems and effort uh, uh, and programs across the department um, in, uh, and focus our resources appropriately is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Well, Eric, to that end, um, you know, there's, a, there's thousands of beautiful minds out there uh, that want to help, just like uh, you as, as a patriot wanted to come back and, to, and, and serve again. And, uh, and I want to say as my commercial that uh, for any of you that have not tried public service, I would uh, encourage you to give it a try because it tastes great. Um, but on that end, you know, what is the most effective? It's always a, a frustrating sort of balance, right? Hey, I, I think I have some ideas, some capabilities, some, some, some solutions that could really help the department with their mission. Uh, and, and, and what's the most effective way to do that, right? You're going to get a CTO on board, you know, is there a vendor management office that, that perhaps gets stood up. What, what's the, what's the best way to do that other than to respond to an RFI or a, or a, an RFP that's kind of out on the street versus some, getting some of that thinking in early about the art of the possible. Sure. Yeah, no, I, um, we, so yeah, at our CTO office uh, does have a vendor engagement team. They uh, set up a monthly vendor day where we're able mm. to uh, bring in pitches from, uh, from uh, folks across industry on anything they think that we'll find interesting. And I think we can make sure to get that, uh, that email box out. So folks have insight there. Uh, looking to do more uh, more events like this, also ones where we can learn from you and not just just me talking at you the whole time. And uh, the um, uh, and I know uh, Soraya and I are doing some events with some of the groups that she pulls together of our uh, of our vendors as well uh, very soon. Uh, and then yeah, it's something that we will will look more uh, and make sure to get out to this group the right uh, the right ways to engage uh, so that uh, we can best understand uh, what you all can bring to the table. Eric, I really do appreciate it on behalf of everyone. Back to you, Megan. 
Great. Well, well, thank you so much, Luke, for being part of this today. And Mr. Heisen, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we really appreciated you being so generous with your time. And, you know, I know industry really looks forward to helping you succeed in your role. And we hope that HSDF can continue to be a, a helpful resource. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed this. Great. And, and thanks to all of our audience for joining us today. And I just want to, again, recognize our event partners today, Dell Technologies, GDIT, and Red Hat. And we have an upcoming virtual symposium on June 9th around the evolution of federal cybersecurity. So stay tuned for an invitation to that event. We're going to be featuring some expert speakers from the White House, DHS, the Department of Justice, Congress, and leadership from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So we hope you can join us again then. And uh, thanks again to everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Today's program was produced by the Homeland Security and Defense Forum and made possible by the support of our partners, Dell Technologies, GDIT, and Red Hat. Video of today's presentation and other HSDF original programs can be found on the HSDF YouTube channel. Subscribe today for hours of insightful policy discussions. Stay tuned for information on additional HSDF symposiums in 2021, including the evolution of federal cybersecurity in June, empowering government through hybrid cloud in July, and designing AI ML to support government in September. For more information, visit www.hsdf.org.